Now let's move on to the next journal, which is called the Payroll Journal. Now there's a lot of issues we need to understand about payroll to really do this justice. We're going to spend a major share of today talking about payroll. Some of you have worked with payroll before. Many of you haven't. So I think that this, this information will be very enlightening to you. Oftentimes the only thing that people have seen about payroll is their paycheck and that they've had way too much taxes withheld from it, right? Okay? We all feel that way. Unfortunately, when, when clients or their employees come up to me and complain about that, all I can do is refer them to their congressman or congresswoman, okay? So, let's talk about, first of all, one issue to understand about payroll is whether you need it or not, okay? There are different classifications. There's two primary classifications of workers, employee, contractor, okay? Employees are those people that meet a certain criteria that you're going to pay and withhold taxes from their paycheck. Contractors are those people that you're simply going to pay by invoice. Or sometimes they don't even, they should, they should actually provide an invoice. You want them to provide an invoice, but that isn't not necessarily required that they do that. The nice thing about contractors is you don't have to withhold taxes from their paycheck. If they work 10 hours at $20 an hour, you give them a check for $200 and they worry about the taxes. Now, up until the mid-50s, that's how everybody was in this country. We didn't, no, employers were not a tax collector. At the end of the year, you wrote your taxes, your check for the taxes. But in the mid-50s, some require, the, the taxes went up, the cost of government went up, and that's when they started becoming a tax collector, okay, for employees. So since that time, there's been a lot of creativity on the part of employers to get their workers as contractors. Now to establish whether a person is an employee or a contractor, the IRS, and this is by statute through Congress, has approved 20 different considerations or criteria when evaluating whether a person is a contractor or an employee. We've looked at those 20 criteria and we boiled them down to three primary considerations because many of the 20 items are very redundant. They speak of similar type items. And when I, can't, I have a hard time memorizing 20 things, but I can memorize three without any trouble at all. And so this is what we've provided to help you keep this in the top of your mind. One is exclusivity. This is actually a word. I've seen it. It's in the dictionary. Exclusivity. What that means is does this worker perform this role solely for one company or do they provide it or even hold out to provide it for many, for multiple companies? Now, if they only provide it for one company, what do you think that they appear to be? Employee. If they hold out to provide it for more than one company, they might appear to be a contractor. Is that right? Now, how do they prove whether they're holding out or not? Do they advertise in the yellow pages? That's one consideration they have. Do they have business cards? Do they have a business license? All those things are considered to see, are they holding themselves out to provide this service for more than one company? So they might only now do it for one business. But if they are looking like they're trying to provide it for many, even though they're not at this time, they could be considered a contractor, okay? There are two other considerations. We've only got the one. And if any one of these considerations apply, it doesn't mean that the IRS will necessarily agree with you, but they can't go back and penalize you for past mistakes, okay? If you've got an argument, they can say from here on out, you're changing it. But at least you're safe for the past, okay? The second one is tools, who owns the tools? And when we're talking about tools, we're not necessarily talking about hammers and saws. We can be talking about computers and calculators, too. Now, very often in the construction business, in order to maintain a contractor relationship with the workers, they lease the tools. 
to the workers. In other words, they're owned by the construction company, but they lease them at a fee, and they actually withhold that fee from the worker's pay, or else they'll invoice them for it. So that's the second one. And the third consideration is control. And out of the three, this one is the most significant. It is the one that shows up more often in those 20 rules than anything else. And when we say control, we're saying, who tells the worker how, when, and where they're going to do the job? Certainly, if the company tells the worker how, when, and where they're going to do the job, they're influencing or exercising control over that worker. And as such, that person looks like an employee. One of my client's daughters graduated from high school. She'd worked in restaurants before and so forth. And, and her first job was working for an insurance agent. And she was the receptionist, the only person working for him. And she came home the first payday and said, Mom, I love this guy. He is so nice to me. I really enjoy my new job. He is so good to me that he doesn't even withhold taxes from my paycheck. <laughs> you know, she had worked in restaurants and so forth to the point she always had taxes withheld in the past. Now this guy is being so thoughtful as to not withhold taxes. Now, her mother knew enough to say, something's wrong here, honey. You need to call our accountant. So she called me. And uh, so I went through these three rules. I said, first of all, are you doing this for anybody else? What do you think her answer was? No. No, no this is an eight to five job, you know, and I got a date at night. I don't have time to do it for anybody else, okay? So, no, it's just for him. That was it. Who owns the computer and the television or telephone? He does. he does. So he owns the tools. So so far, strike one, strike two, right? And does he tell you how, when, and where to do the job? Yeah. Oh, certainly. He says this is where you're going to answer the phone. You're going to be in here at eight thirty. You're going to take a lunch. You're going to, you know, all these things he controls, right? Strike three. Is there any question how he should treat her? No, she's got to be an employee. Is he treating her as an employee? No. He's treating her as a contractor. If the IRS were to identify that, he could be susceptible to significant penalties. Now, these penalties can be severe. Now, let's go on. Let me go on with the story and explain that. She said, well, <laughs> I like it this way, <laughs> you know? I mean, I like to have all my money. Is she escaping taxes? No. She's still going to have to report the income, and she's still going to have to pay the taxes. It's going to happen, but even worse, she's going to have to pay more taxes. Because as an employee, the employer withholds only half of the FICA. As a self-employed contractor, the contractor has to pay both halves of FICA. Okay? So instead of just her half, which is 7.65%, we'll look at that in a few minutes, she's going to have to pay 15.3% for FICA taxes. Okay? She's still going to have to pay. She doesn't escape the obligation. Plus, she doesn't have unemployment benefits. If she should ever lose the job, she can't make an unemployment claim. And secondly, if she gets hurt on the job, it can be, it possibly could be her problem, not his. Okay, so are there some advantages for him to continue to treat her as a contractor? Certainly. Are there disadvantages for her to maintain this situation? Yes. So she asked, what should I do? I simply invited or in, encouraged her to go back to work the next day and talk to him about it and ask him if, she, he, would if he would treat her as, a con as an employee. She never got back with me. It wasn't my business to go in and price. So I never found out, but I did invite him, her, to have him call me if there were any questions on what to do and what needed to be done. So anyway, a lot of employers out there doing that. Uh, and some of them are doing it ignorantly, just not knowing the law. Some of them are doing it intentionally, knowing the law and just doing this. <laughs> you know, I hope I never get caught. 
Unfortunately, let me give you another example. This was a client that was treating his workers as contractors, and they were clearly employees. Again, on the exclusivity tools and control, they did not qualify as contractors. I encouraged him to make the switch. He didn't want to make the switch, but when I showed him the penalties would be $20,000, he made the switch voluntarily. Uh, and six months later, he got pulled into an audit. What happened is, which could have happened at any time, one of his employees walked in and made a, an employment claim. It was a seasonal business. Made an unemployment claim. Not knowing, I mean, the employee was naive. He just thought that as long as you were an employee, you were or as long as you worked for somebody, you qualified for unemployment benefits. And he reported that he had worked for this guy for the past three years during the season. Workforce Services went back in and determined that they only had the last few months there. So they called him in and said, hey, uh, what's the deal here? And, and they called, well, they actually sent him a letter asking him to come in for an audit. Now, because he had made the switch voluntarily a few months earlier, they just slapped his hand and said, don't do it again, gave him a $50 fine. But had they established, had he not made that switch, they would have fined him for all past unemployment claims, or at least the premiums, and then they would have notified the State Tax Commission and the IRS of what he'd been doing. They have that ability between agencies to do that. And then they would have come in with federal withholding. So that's how, that's the most common way for them to identify that is some worker either intentionally or unintentionally going and making an unemployment claim, they going back and looking at their records and finding out they don't have the reporting for it. And it uh, happens every day. Uh, and it can cost a company, it can put a company out of business. Okay? Now, some of you are looking at doing freelancing for uh, accounting. So let's go through those three rules. Exclusivity. Are you going to hold out, do it for more than one company? Yeah, if you're going to freelance, yeah. Now, initially with that first client, say, well, I only have one client. But if you've got business cards or if you're, if you're in the yellow pages or if you've got a, bi a business license, it appears you're holding out. And so as you're building more clientele, you're still all right, right? Secondly, tools. Who owns the tools? Who owns the computer? It's your computer. It's your computer, okay? So you own it. And as such, again, it appears you're a contractor, right? And the third one's control. Are they dictating how, when, and where their job's going to be done? And as we've discussed earlier, the answer is no. So you have control over that. So there is no question of which way you should be treated as a contractor. Okay? Okay. Exclusivity tools and control. Just remember, etc. Okay? etc. You ever seen that King and I movie? You know, the old, the old Brenner classic? And he's talking to the school teacher, and he says, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, he's talking to his employee, okay? So et cetera is the, t is the abbreviation we'll use. Okay.